territory. And unfortunately, it's a part of the business. You know, um, you you can't have 15 players on the roster, so therefore you have to cut down to 12 in order for the 12 that's on the team to get paid on June 1st. You know, it's one of those situations where, you know, the rookies and some middle-of-the-road vets are coming in in a bad situation because they won't even have an opportunity to fight for a job. A team either got to believe in a rookie or a middle of the road vet to put them on the team or come tomorrow, which I believe is the 26th, a lot of players are going to be cut without even having an opportunity to try out. And unfortunately, it's just the nature of the business. Now, as far as the force majeure, um, you know, I think with the league, they're trying to end this, how you say, they're trying to decide if they're going to have a season. And if they're not going to have a season, and like I told you before, at this point, I'm saying that it's going to be tough to have a 34-game season with a playoff with them beginning right now. So I already know that that schedule is going to have to be adjusted. Some games are going to have to go away. So even on the flip side of that, what's the pay now? Is it the full pay? Is it prorated to the point that they're playing? as well as what's the new playoff format is going to be. It's going to be a lot of tough decisions that's going to um, have to be made. And the toughest one of all, which I'm pretty sad about, is coming tomorrow where you're going to see a lot of players that are going to be cut from teams, not getting an opportunity to show their skills, and I'm sure they've been working out. Then from there, unless this league come back, I can't see the league or any of the teams playing the, the players their full salary. So they're going to have to come up with something, whether that's prorated, is there a percentage, which once you get into a percentage, a percentage is different for everyone. Um, it's going to be some big decisions got to be made. And I can't wait to see what's going to um, happen and stuff. So it's going to be interesting. Yeah, it's definitely going to be interesting. I'm just wondering if they're just going to slide over, you know, what they're doing on the men's side with the force majeure and, uh, you know, 25% pay cut. Um, because the men make millions of dollars and we make thousands. Exactly. And so, you know, it's got to exactly. be something that's really got to be worked out um, that out of, out of fairness. Anybody want to elaborate on and that? Jamaica? I want to say one more thing before, before you know, not to cut you off, but it's interesting <laughs> because I would believe if the women are playing, there's no way you're going to take a 25% cut. And the reason I say a 25% cut, that's a large amount considering like what you said, Adrian, they're, the women are not making millions. And at the same time, I still look at it like I said last week. Anybody that's going back out there to play, um, they're putting their lives in jeopardy. So 25%, that's a lot. As far as I'm concerned, they need to pay them all their money because once again, I said, while they're out there playing, everybody want all the sports back and they're out there playing, fans or no fans, but everybody else is in the comfort of their own home. So I know it won't be 25%. That would be way too large of a pay cut for, for the WNBA. Mm. Absolutely. PT, question for you, PT. Um, from, from the standpoint of the players that get cut um, or, you know, are waived prior to even having an opportunity to make a team, do you see maybe teams being able to bring those players back um, into the fold after the season starts somehow and then trying to kind of give them an opportunity or it's kind of, it's just, it just is what it is right now. <laughs> what do you think about um, that? Um, okay, so so you know, <laughs> I'm just saying, once that payroll start, and that's the business of it, once that payroll yeah. start, in order for any, this is why they got to get down. They have right. to get down in order for the payroll to be correct at 12. The thing right. that can happen that if I'm one of the players that's released, the good thing about it is if another team wants you, hey, they can pick you up and put you on their roster so they still have an opportunity to make a team if another team feel that they get better than the team. And you still have a lot of young teams out there that can use some of the talent that I know will be getting cut, especially if it's some of the, the veteran players that get cut. You know, right. there's some young teams that could use some veteran experience. But far as bringing them back, I can't see it because the payroll don't start it. And if you were going to bring them back, then you should have just left them on the payroll, let them roll until you figured out what the season was and have a training camp where they would get paid because they were looking forward to it, then cut. 
But to bring them back, I think once once the WNBA decide they're going to play and it kicks off, it ain't no going back to what would have been. Those okay. rosters are going to be set. They were going to training camp. That's another opportunity for the league to prepare for if they do go to one location, what's the count? It's not a number that's, oh, it might be this, be that. They will have a definite number as far as, you know, players and coaches and stuff like that. Unfortunately, once tomorrow comes, it's K Sarah Sarah. And if another team wants you, you're gonna get an opportunity. And I do believe that some of the players that that get released will be will find the new home on other teams. Mm. Mm. Wow, absolutely, ladies. Make sure you meet, mute your phones. The um, since you're on the block, Tamika, you know, I always want to come from a player's perspective. Um, the WNBA is, and this is from ESPN, um, says that after the business element goes into it and the logistics and everything like that the league could possibly opt to open in one site and then eventually transition to its team home arenas. This will of course complete, you know, they, they'll of course compete without fans in the, in the audience. Um, I would say like the Vegas Summer League, kind of like that setup where all of the teams are in one city for the season. Um, what would you say to something like that happening? How could, how could something like that work? I mean, I'm sure they can, from a logistics standpoint, uh, could make it work as far as just having the space um, to, to do something like that. But it's so many variables that are going to go into, you know, you bringing all the teams into one area. And then how do, how do you make that work with families and uh, testing? And are you testing these players daily? And, you know, I, I think no, no sports – organization wants to be the first to have one player test positive coming back, you know, and, it, and what, what are going to be the ramifications <laughs> of that? So it's, it's just a lot of variables that are going to go into um, you doing this. And I think, you know, with the, with the NBA um, kind of um, saying that they were going to try to do something in, um, in, in, uh, at the Disney worldwide of sports and, I think people are just trying to see how this is all going to, who's going to be the first to get this thing, get this ball rolling. And, and then what are the ramifications going to be from that? And then, you know, kind of play, play it by ear after that. But I, I think it's just so many variables that go into it that you, you may not want to be the first, you know, to come up with all of these things to try to get it done and then have a player or, you know, it's a, a organization be, be kind of plagued with with having you know players test positive for this coronavirus, and then what? You know, did you kind of set this this whole thing back? Um, so it, it's going to be interesting to see how they start this. I know you know everybody's dying, you know, for sports to come back on, um, but at, at at the least you got to look at the players and and is it safe for the players to be out there? you know, playing. I know we elaborated a little bit on, on the sweat factor, um, the contact sport, and, and what that, what are the ramifications of that? We don't even know. So it's just going to be interesting to see how this all plays out. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I agree with you on that. Um, I know that, uh, that Penny has some things that she probably wants to say about it, but it is an issue. It's it's something that's going to be brought to the table, whether they're with, whether they're going to do it or not. Um, and just like uh, you know, as far as the draft was concerned, the WNBA went in head first with the virtual draft, and it was a success. Do they think that they can have the same success with this pandemic, Penny? Well, it's two different things because when you're doing a virtual draft, which I was happy because everybody had to watch it since they're in their house. <laughs> but it's, it's two different things because when you do a virtual drive, people are in their house. Like what me said, and this is what I don't, I haven't heard anybody talk about. Say one player gets COVID-19, right? So when you, just like when, what happened when, uh, when the NBA, when the player got it, then they had to test all the other teams. What happens to the schedule when whatever player has it on the team that played against the other team that needs to go into 14-day or three-week hibernation? 
So do those teams not play during the time that they have to be down? What, how do how do the other teams come in and play? And if they all in, do they all go down since they're all in one area and nobody knows for 14 days? So there's so much, it's a difference. I'm in my house, I'm being drafted, there's no one around. But if I have COVID-19, one player gets it, you have to test all the other teams. And then, then yeah. like you said, what's the quarantine time? 14 days, right? So in 14 days, does does it go away? Does the whole league go away again? for 14 days, you can't just have two teams out because I'm sure those other two teams will have to be playing other teams. So how do you make up the schedule in that? It's a lot to, it's a lot to take in. And, you know, to be honest with you is what I said last week, um, as far as I'm concerned, they need to take it on the chin, pay, play, pay the ladies because it's not their fault with this pandemic and show that they still believe in women and they're invested in women and we have a right to be here in sports. It's nowhere near the money for the for the um, NBA because I mean, how do you, how can you, there's no way, I don't care what anybody say, that you can control that environment. You can't even control a kindergarten class, let alone an environment where people are gonna be competing. And like I say, you're always gonna have a deputy dog that's sneaking out you know, even if let's say the player isn't sneaking out, is their family sneaking out, bringing it back to them? You know, and still, we still don't know, okay, really, how can you catch it? We know some of the elements, but is that the only way you can catch it? You know, because I'm hearing the debate now and I, I watch it on TV. I don't watch so much of it because it can get depressing. Some people think it's harmful to even wear the mask. Some people don't want to wear the mask because they say you're breathing it back into yourself. And then there's others say, oh, wear the mask. And in the beginning, it wasn't a mask. You can go out, just be distanced. Now you have to wear a mask. And this is what I'm saying. There's so many loose elements about what and how you can really catch this that I still think there's a lot unknown. And to be honest with you, I don't, I wouldn't be putting any players at risk right now because I wouldn't want to be responsible for that one player that catches it. I mean, look in New York, Patrick Ewan has it now. Yeah, I was I you was know? reading that the other day and I was like, whoa, you know. And I, was I wouldn't want to. That. I wouldn't want that responsibility personally. Yeah, I wouldn't I want would, the responsibility nah, nah. if someone died for me to tell their family, yes. hey, you know, I'm sorry, but you died because you wanted to play a game. It's a game. I don't think game life, game life. No, I choose life. 24 seven, seven days a week, I choose life. And you keep the marketing going, you keep the social media, which a lot of teams are doing an excellent job at social media. Um, people understand, and hey, when we can come back and there's a vaccine or we can come back with a, a really ironclad proof, something that if there's a vaccine, somebody gets sick, you can give it to them. Then you come back and everybody come back and support the sport. but. Basketball, a game, life. No, I, I choose life. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it goes uh, when you're talking about sponsorships and the things that they're doing on social media. They are doing a great job. I I, I definitely see the the, the uh, Mystics out there really pumping a lot of stuff. Um, and I follow a lot of different teams. Um, um, the Sparks, you know, they pump out some good some good info too. Not just because oh, you're, that's Mark. You're sitting that's, on the phone. Like you guys, your Instagram page, your Instagram page is tight. I'm not even, I'm not even mad at it. You know, the people that are behind. Uh, kudos I to gotta them. give, I gotta give Sophia and Matt a shout out from the sports because even, I mean, they be doing their thing. They creative to all get out, and I'm telling you, uh, they be, I love them guys. They be doing great work, and they still doing great work, and I'm always proud of them. Yeah, and people don't give enough credit to, um, you know, the the creative department and the content that they that they put out and how they, you know, navigate uh, through each uh, social media platform, you know, and over on Twitter to, you know, to Facebook, to Instagram, to, you know, WhatsApp is even trying to come up now because they have uh, video conferencing that they, that that they're trying to push now as well. And so a lot of people don't even know that, you know, 
those platforms are still Facebook. Facebook, um, you know, they have Instagram and WhatsApp, for, you know, just for some people out there that don't know, I'll give you some knowledge. But I tell you what, it, you know, it's important right now. And this prompts me to Tara, you know, the NBA Players Union just signed a global partnership um, with uh, a company called Famer. And it's a mobile sports coaching and mentoring platform that will enable athletes and their trainers to share custom training videos, which I think this is hot with kids, and then they split the revenue. And so um, over on the Players Association side, um, they're, they're starting to, you know, be proactive and helping, but this isn't, this isn't for everybody. Um, there's only a few people that it's helping. That's why they need so many more pro programs out there because when you put these programs out there, it's only gonna, you know, like, uh, affect probably like 10 to 20 players and there's a lot of players in the league in both leagues so you got to have a, a, a multitude of programs out there tara talk about how important it is for the planet actions like like these um to the uh, are to the growth of the uh, 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 to the growth of the wnba let's just push the nba to the side you know where they would yeah. set it up because there's going to be there's going to be um some unemployment out there and uh they really need to show these kids some ways that they can you know generate some revenue on the other side? Um, I just want to say that I think any merge that is going to support anything virtually right now is, is a good move. Uh, even after COVID, because we will get through this, um, there's just situations where there's uncertainty sometimes with, like Penny would talk, was talking about the scheduling and different things can pop up. So I think that anything virtual and any merge um, that will allow people to still enjoy the sport, still be proactive in the sport, um, it will it will just be a good move. And I wanted to, um, I just want to um, go back a little bit on what Penny said about um, with paying the, the women, um, the reducing of what their pay is and how this, I feel that if they do, I just want to just say this, if they do go back, uh, because a lot of these women, they have families. This is their this is their income. This is how they survive through this pandemic, and no one's paying them to get through it like other stimulus programs. I feel that there should be a, a COVID, uh, you know, a COVID fund for people who can track this while they're playing. If they, and they must return, and, and that's the decision that there should be a protocol put in place that they get a certain amount of funding to carry them through when they have to social distance. And when they have to, when they can't play anymore, also with their family. But getting back to um, the merging of this company, I looked up this company, and I think it's amazing. I think it's amazing for so many different reasons. Um, even though it's it's starting out on a small scale, that with the players, we were talking about their mental state last week and how depressing this can be, or how they retract in their normal routines. An athlete has to go. They're designed to move. Like that's, you guys know this. So when you're stationary, it's like, what am I doing? So when I read a little bit on the, the company, I, I thought it was awesome because this is a way that athletes can still feel like they're in the game, right? You, you guys know as athletes, that's the mentality. You got to be in the game. got to have your head right. got to have your body right. So I think that this feeds not only to the physical part, but also to the human connection, because being separated from your coaches now, a lot of these athletes, and you guys know, your coaches, you know, that's your person that you look up to, that's your person that you that you kind of come to, to to feed you with what you need to perform high. And so the pressure is there with athletes to always perform high. So how are you now performing when you're at home? And then and as far as um, it opening up, employment opportunities, I think it's great because when I went to the site, you can apply to be a coach. Um, and obviously there's revenue that you can make. And I just think that number one, it's going to keep people safe, right? Because they still, they don't have to go to a facility to learn, you know, coaching techniques and to even follow them and work out. But number two, it, it provides a source of income, even though it's supplemented and it may not be a much, it, it may not be much as something. So I just think that overall, uh, growth. This is what I love about COVID. I don't love COVID, but I love that it's just an opportunity to opposition, but the opportunities that lie on the other side of it, you know, you, you can kind of set your own tone with that. So I just think that 
you know, it will invoke once again, human connection, which we really need in this time. I look forward to my little brunch with you ladies. I feel like I'm going to a, re a restaurant. <laughs> I feel like I'm going, like my daughter said, mom, why are you doing your hair? I said, I'm going to brunch, Maya. <laughs> but we have to have these, <laughs> we have to have these mental things that make us still feel, feel like there's some sort of a normalcy out there for us. I think it's awesome. Um, for the children. I think it's awesome for players. And I just think it's it's a wonderful business move. And I just pray that it grows into something else or they add to it and people adopt it. And another thing I, I looked at was it feeds the coaching aspect. It feeds, you know, still human connection, even though it's virtual. And then it just, once again, when COVID goes away, this is still a component when people have vacations, when people, they still can use this resource for their children or, or um, athletes to be trained. But I still think, like I, I mentioned last week, there still should be something put in place for the mental component. I think it would be awesome for them to also have life coaches, hello, <laughs> seriously, to get to really, to really train the, the mental component to it. So I just think that this, it's so important to body, mind, and spirit. I mean, it's, that's not a cliche for a reason. It's really the truth. When you feed the mind, the body is going to follow. If you don't feed the mind, the body will only follow to the capability that it's trained to do so. So if you train in the mind to grow through these situations and to still say, my head can be in the game. I'm happy. I'm excited. I'm not anxious. We're going to return whenever this happens, but I'm going to get me together while I'm, while we have all of this free time. I just think, I think it's awesome. And I think the company's awesome after I researched it a little bit, but they do need that mental component because it's just coaching techniques uh, at this point from what I read. And Tari, if they bring the WNBA back or the NBA back, I'm gonna tell you right now, they need about 20 to 25 of you <laughs> because <laughs> I, I really mean that because the mind is, is, is something because, okay, if you're not winning, people are going to be like a stress with their family or, or this situation yeah. you're asking someone to stay in. And that's the one thing, like I say, covert, not happy with the situation and everything around it, but it's putting a, a it's shining an even bigger spotlight on that. You do need life coaches. You do need people around to, to have conversations about this, you know, where before they go, oh, we just, oh, yeah, if you need them, we'll send you one. No, to be honest with you, every team should have one on staff, not just for COVID-19, just for anything going on in your life. Because I know for a fact it's a difference in me talking to my friend who's going to agree with me all the time, or even if they disagree sometimes versus a voice that's just objective and can bring other skill sets and make you use other senses. You know, it needs to become a part of the game now because me, Adrian, we all know competing in the WNBA or any professional level, it's, it's high intensity. A lot of crap goes on, you know, between the crap, the intensity, the preparation and all the politics. Oh no, you want a player to have someone that they don't have to seek out that's there if they want to see them, you know, not telling the team what you're talking about, but they're there, they're present, you know, and um, I think every team should have one and it should just put in the bigger spotlight on it, whether it's COVID or not. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And right now is a better time than any because there, there's not a whole lot of noise. There's not the basketball bouncing. It's not the pressure of playing great. It's not the pressure that you put on yourself and, the team puts on you the great time to to sit down with a mentor to sit down with a behavioral specialist and, and and talk about some of the stresses and you get to know that person so that when the season does start you'll have a, a strong foundation built with that person um to know how you can you know help them through the times and um you know i i feel for um a lot of the girls uh come come Tuesday, what's today? Yeah, Monday, Tuesday. Tomorrow, uh, yeah. Yeah, Tuesday yeah, at uh, whatever the timetable the, is. Yeah, but to those to those girls, I just say, you know, there's been disappointments all across the board. I know that each and every one of us could raise our hand and say that we got cut from something. You know, I remember 
uh, USA Basketball, the toughest platform to play on, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, putting so much pressure on myself and not making it. And then uh, going home and then they ended up calling me back. You just never know what happens in between. So you stay ready so you don't have to get ready. We've said that I don't know how many times. And so, and so, so to those people, um, you know, that are going to deal with that, you just have to keep grinding because we've all faced something as basketball players where uh, it didn't go our way and we didn't get to we didn't get to play right away or we didn't get to play on that team that was going to compete for the for the country or what have you and so um you know um just keep plugging that's all I can say is there anything you could say to any of them to make them I think um I was just sitting here listening to Tyra and listening to PT and you know i was thinking about you know even in my career and how beneficial it would have been to sit down and talk to somebody about the mental side of the game i didn't do that until probably three years before retirement you know trying to deal with transitioning and things like that but if i had um somebody you know that i could speak with and i didn't even to be honest with you i didn't even seek it out you know i didn't even it wasn't even a thought um until you know i almost was retired so it would have been it's and and you thinking about now what these players are dealing with now it would really have been really beneficial you know to have somebody on staff like pt said right now and then and then be having you know virtual calls with with the players while they're dealing with some of these things that they're yes. going through now it's a lot of stresses you don't know if you're playing you don't know if you're getting paid you know, you're trying to stay ready. It's just, a, it's a lot that's going on. And, and, and to have, to be able to have somebody to, to bounce those, those things off would have been so beneficial now. Um, so I, I, I completely agree that, you know, if you could have somebody, you know, a mental advocate in your corner, somebody that you could speak with in a professional one, not just your friends and family, mm -hmm. like BT said, uh, it would definitely, <laughs> definitely help you in these times and 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 moving forward you know it definitely should be something that they implement from the league standpoint yeah. i totally agree with you make and you look at what's about to happen here there's so many layers like and obviously you know i'm thinking as a gm what i was for 20 years there's so many layers that are about to happen right now that you need that person there for them to speak with and what i mean by that Imagine getting cut, not even getting the opportunity to show your skills, right? Then the next phase is when they get cut tomorrow, there a lot of kids and some of the middle of the road best don't know that your your insurance is going to run out at the end of at the end of June. What mm -hmm. are the steps to get you back with insurance, right? What are the steps for those players that got cut? Um, going to unemployment. And I feel that the league, the players union, the league, both, if not definitely the players union, has an obligation to not let them, when they get cut, they're on their own. There should be some right. protocol, some paperwork, because a lot of college players, they're not going to know how to fill out, how do I apply for unemployment? You know, what box do I check to make sure they get it right? Because I've spoken to people that they did one wrong thing and all of a sudden, it's taking two more months before they even get a, a unemployment check. You know what I'm saying? They have a right. They need to have a package. If this happened and you need um, help filling it out, um, there should be someone there for them to call because the insurance is going to run out. Okay, what do they do about insurance now? Do they not have insurance? You know, it's this is going to be devastating to some people. And this is why yes. I say they have an obligation. They need, to sh they need to be there and show up for these players even after they get cut, even after June, all the way to the end of July until they can get some health insurance. So they get their unemployment, how do they fill it out? You know, what's the next steps? You know, stay involved and be connected because, you know, just like this pandemic, nobody asked for it. And they really mm -hmm. had nothing to do with this. It's a situation that all of us are in. And it's just so, it's, it's, it's so many more layers than, hey, just some cut tomorrow and that's the, the end, you know? Yeah. And as, as, as you know, it, as of right now, are there any programs that are currently in place crossover programs right now that 
some of our some some of the kids that got that got uh, drafted can go into like I, I can't even think of any off of the top of my head. I know that there's 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 programs as far as the retired players association is concerned, but there's no no programs that I know that are currently in place because they need something in a hurry. And whatever happened to those internship programs that they had when the league first started, when we start when we first started playing. If anybody remembers that, when Pamela Wheeler was the uh, was the head of the uh, of the players union, and uh, she had put in place uh, the internships with the different companies, the different sponsors that were in the league, uh, you could do internships with them, and then if it panned out, they hired you. You guys remember that? Yeah, and there's still some programs now in place like that. You know, I know Kara Braxton went into nike last year um and i know i i believe don't you know quote me on it but i believe that actually came about via the WNBA. those things are in place but the reality of it is right now everything's shut down everybody's Jeez. trying to figure out what a new normal is going to be so i'm sure probably in the the near the the close future a lot of that stuff's going to go away until they even figure out what's going to be the structure to even bring the how you say the regular employees back, you know, in those companies. I believe, to be honest with you, you know, yeah, you have the the NBA, the retirement association, but once again, that's the NBA. So a lot of the stuff, a lot of the NBA people know about it. The WNBA, we, we're what, it's 23 years now. And going into its 24th, we need to build our own platform. And it'll start out slow just with the WNBA, but it has to get rolling because guess what? Even if you started 50 years from now, it still has to get rolling. So why not start the ball rolling now where there is a different board that sits right there with the players union or past players that played on there to give advice because yeah, you have all these people that are in it now, but you also need the history of what, what was and what is and what should be. I think you need more than just those current player voices because you still need someone to know the history of it, how it evolved and, you know, what's best for the whole league. And it's going to get to a point where, don't get me wrong, uh, I say this, that we have to find a way as WNBA players to maximize our talent, maximize our players' branding, that they can earn money while they're playing on and off the court. I'm going to look forward, and I hope I don't, you know, I'm making a joke about this, but I hope I'm able to be alive and see it that when, if something happened like this again, that WNBA players will be able to, the WNBA will be able to help its own by giving them jobs, mm -hmm. help their own. You know, we have to get ex WNBA players still on the board, ex WNBA players and current players to get in those executive positions where we can hand a WNBA player a job. We have to get there and we have to get there and we have to start right now that we have to start not always looking for a handout, but a way to create our own mm -hmm. opportunities off the floor as well. And not just relying on oh, the, the, you know, we'll go and get a job with the men's league or the NBA and filter in there. That's great. That's awesome. We need that because we need diversity there, but we also need our own mm -hmm. programs. that's going to put us out there. So that even if we're just moving up the ranks now in 10 years, that next little girl, that guess what? She ain't gonna have to look far because that executive vice president or that mm. CEO or that chief financial officer was a WNBA player. That's gonna be like, oh my God, let me give her a job right now. We have to start doing that. We have to start putting our vets in the pipeline to be able to do that. Absolutely. And there's definitely enough uh, bachelor degrees and master's degrees out there. Um, <laughs> for it to happen, you know, uh, we don't leave school early to go play prof you know, professional basketball. Uh, we graduate and we get our degrees. And so there's definitely a lot of qualified women out there to make that happen. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, pro the, one, the one program that you mentioned, Penny, that's just one program. And so you can't jam a whole bunch of people into that one thing. Mm -hmm. So, you no, know, that's, I totally agree with you. The, main, the main reason why I agree with the fact that, you know, um, there's some there's some programs that that need to be developed so that, uh, you know, in times like these, we can help our own. You know, there's something to be said for helping our own. And um, that that just leads me um, to um, 
you know, just going back to, um, and, and, and it concerns me because I, I just keep thinking about it, you know, um, this, the, just the pay with these, with these, with these girls, um, um, that article stuck out in my mind in Forbes when it was talking about, um, the force majeure and, um, just that 25% and how it just can't happen. It can't happen. I can't even imagine, um, what they what they what they would even think would would be fair other than paying them their regular salary because that's what's fair. <laughs> well, I right. think it's fair. If you want me to go out there and put my life on the line, because really that is what it boils down to, and I don't care what the high salary is. Like I said, I believe it's two twenty five or two fifty. I guess you know I I actually could look it up. Um, my life's worth more than that. So whatever I'm paying for. Yeah, I want to. To be honest with you, I want to be paid the whole salary, even if even if you have to even if you have to take away games or any of that. I don't. I, to be honest with you, if I was a player, I wouldn't care because the point is, I'm still putting my life on the line. It's sort of like just like this last stimulus package that passed, and I noticed, and um, you know, not to get too broad, but I want to use it as an example. I noticed oh. that in the package they had for all the first responders or anyone that was 90 days late on student loans, they were saving off $10,000. Are you kidding me? And I'm talking about just first responders. As far as I'm concerned, if they had any debt, it all should have been wiped out. Because these are people that put their life on the line to treat, I mean, what, thousands? I mean, you look at the death count. So they were treating thousands of patients. In New York alone, and nurses in just to handle that situation. So you mean to tell me they put their lives on the line and the most you can do and the best you can do is shave off $10,000? Give me a break. As far as I'm concerned, every first responder, whatever debt they had when it came to, I'm talking about student loan that's holding probably 90% of America down, it should have been wiped out. <laughs> and you're not talking everybody. Like I say, if you were 90 days late, they gave them 10,000. So you mean to tell me the first responders got the same amount of discount as someone that was 90 days late? No, these are people that put their lives on the line to try to sell it, save as many lives as they can. Um, you mean to tell me, so that little 100,000, maybe some might got 200,000. Once again, it goes back to what's your life worth? As far as I'm concerned, every right. first responder, they debt should have been wiped clean. You don't, they don't pay their debt to society. I mean, what more can you ask for? And this is where I'd be like, what are we talking about here? You know what I'm saying? What are you talking about? I was watching on the news where this lady, I forget what town she lived in, but she hadn't seen her family for 45 days because she went to New York to help out New York. Came back, her kids were so happy to see her, they were crying. She put her life on the line. So if she had a dad and didn't have kids, oh, that's the best she can do? Wipe out $10,000? Come on, we can do better than that. We need to be better. And that's why I say with the players, if they go on to play, yeah, there's a chance. And people may not think it, but as a GM, I'm always thought, oh, my job, while I'm thinking about the things that we need to do, a GM, a good GM is preparing for what can also happen. What are the possibilities here? What can happen? You know, we hope that no one dies, but someone can die. Someone brother, someone sister, someone mother, someone father, uncle can die. So far as I'm concerned, if they come back and play, I don't care if it's a 15 game schedule, they should be paid all the money because everybody else is sitting in the comfort of their home, safe and sound and, and social distancing. It doesn't make sense to me. They should be paid all the money. It shouldn't be a pro rate. That's just, that's just how I feel about it. And if I was still a GM, that's what I would be advocating. I'm not the owner, so the owner could decide. But if he asks my opinion, I would be like, hey, if we pay, if we play, we pay him the whole money. If we don't play, you can pay them the whole money. That's just how I look at it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in a league that can pay them all of their money, I, 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 I agree with them. You know, getting their full salary um, has a pay um, if they decided that they were going to try to pull off something as well. Um, because we just can't afford to, to take a pay cut, period. Um, right. it's just that we is, it is, we just don't make enough money. And so, um, that's, Not that's, at a, all. that's just a whole different story. But, you know, to, to sum it all up, in all honesty, Penny, let's say you're, 
your GM in and you know, you know all of this is getting ready to happen and to, tomorrow's coming and, and, and you know that you got to let go of some, some, some players. You're going to uh, um, have to make some really, really tough decisions. You know, maybe something that you can put out there for a general manager right now that may be stressing about how to handle this situation right now. Yeah, I think all GMs, and you have some really good GMs out there and some veteran GMs and some new GMs, you know, um, when you sit in a GM seat, there's some things you just got to do and you got to do, you know, make the best decision for your, if it, like if it was me, I'm going to make the best decision for my team. And let's just take the Sparks, if I was still there, I'm rolling with my vets. You know, I might have room for one rookie with the way it is, but to be honest with you, looking at their roster, they're not going to be able to keep any of them unless they cut one of the vets. So the vets should be worried. In order to keep the rookies they have, they have to cut a vet because I know what the salary cap there because I was just there. Now, what I would be doing, though, is I would make sure my human, human resource department that I want you to go above and beyond to make sure that if the league isn't doing it, that they know what COBRA is when the insurance is going to find out. But don't just tell them, hey, you got 30 days and your insurance is up. You can apply for COBRA. COBRA, no. Usually the amount of players that's getting cut from a team is somewhere going to be between one and three or maybe four. No, I want my HR person to get on the phone and walk them through it if the league is not going to provide it. You know, my, my speech when I'm cutting them is, hey, unfortunately, this is what we're doing. Um, but in no means saying that you don't belong in the league, you know, it's, it's bad timing. But I would encourage you to come back. Becky Hammond was cut. Look where she's at right now. You know, there were a lot of players that got cut. Jessica Breeland, that's on Phoenix team. She took her two, three years to make it. Then she became a star in Atlanta. Now she's on Phoenix team. So to the GMs out there, I think a lot of GMs already know we have to do what we have to do. But I would say to the GMs, because it is a pandemic and uncertain time, I would encourage every GM to go that extra mile to make sure that all those players that were cut um, understand how to reapply for insurance. If you need help with unemployment, if the league don't provide it, we're going to help you do that. I will require that of my HR department. And Meek, I played with Meek, and Meek experienced me as a GM. I truly believe, I know, and my players would say um, this too, I always went the extra mile for my players. And I would definitely go the extra mile here because it's needed and it's warranted. So that's that would be my advice to the GMs. I know you got a tough job to do, but go the extra mile to make sure that those players that you're cut um, understand and have, you know, just the circumstances. But we want to give you every resource so you can be successful, not just with this basketball, but in this life and during this pandemic oh where you can get yourself set up. That would be my advice to the GMs. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Tara, I know that you deal with a lot of families um, and different issues. Usually when when families deal with a loss, especially with unemployment, what are some of the things that they go through and maybe some tips that you can you can you can help some of the players with right now? Well, I just want to um, piggyback off of one thing that Penny said. The pandemic is not an excuse, but it really will be helpful when making these cuts because it won't directly point to the player themselves. A lot of players are, are raised to think, keep your head in the game, knock it off, shake it off. They're never allowed to truly feel things. And then their, their um, you know, coaches say, hey, you can take out the frustration when you get on the field. But right now, no, 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 no. Once again, it's, it's preparing them to have coping skills. But since this is yes. abrupt, you know, the only thing, because that is where the lack is, it's just the coping skills. That is where the lack is. And this is why the transition is so hard for players and influencers when whatever their game is in life, when it stops, because they've never been able to see along the way or learn how to cope that this will stop one day. They just train their brains to think like, I'm super at this and this is it. This is not it that we're seeing now with COVID. So with families who any loss, you know, the loss, it can be either attached to you individually or it could be attached to a situation. So even when a person, you know, I coach parents who've lost children. I mean, how could you do that? I'm a mother, so I can't even say 
what the formula is. We just get through it the best way that we can. But I do, a lot of them want to take on, if I only did this with her, if I only did this with him, that responsibility, a loss is not the responsibility if you could not control it. So I think talking to people, you know, on that aspect that this is not something that has to do with your performance. This has something to do with a government who kind of didn't set us up for success because they knew something was here and they didn't share it quick enough to, you know, to, to stop this in its tracks and it's grown into this. So when the, the cuts come, once again, that's how I would advise is just to focus on the circumstances, not on, not make it personal. Like this is not about you. This is about what we have going on. But like Penny said, you're a great athlete. Just because you're being cut from the team does not mean that you're cut off from us. And that's how I would approach it to where they would feel that there's still a, a, a um, support system within the team for them so that when that transition it's not just like boom it's like okay i got cut but they're still guiding me hr is giving me things to do okay they've given me information okay i have support here so you see it just starts to die down a little bit instead of abrupt like when someone dies you can't bring them back you know what i mean it's the hardest people to to really work with to be honest with you but it's still a loss so i would just encourage people to not take this personal that's the bottom line not take it personal and then just for the institutions and the managers to set them up for success with coping skills. Because once again, a lot of them don't even have the skill, even as adults, because they had to shake it off and deal with it in a game. Well, now the game is gone. So where are they getting their stuff off at? There's no game anymore for them. So they have to learn to get their stuff off in other games in life, once again, which goes back to what we said they must have avenues, exposure to avenues that can create revenue outside of just playing the game. I agree with you. I definitely do on that. Do you have any closing thoughts to make her? And um, I would just piggyback off what uh, PT and Tara said. Um, this is probably the best time for for uh for the for the incoming rookies to kind of start thinking about you know a plan b um of course you know you don't want to think about that because you just kind of start your professional career but you know we we um we talk about this all the time um you gotta kind of think about that and this what what better way or what better time um than now to think about a plan b because um, basketball as we know could be taken from us um, at any given moment. Um, this is a pandemic, you know, it could have been an injury. It could have been anything that could kind of catapult you into the next stages of your life. And so what better way or what better opportunity than now to start thinking about what you want to do or what you want to pursue after basketball, not knowing how long your career is going to last. Mm. And what better way than to wrap it up on that? <laughs> I tell you, ladies, it's always a pleasure with you guys um, on here. We could go on and on and on and stay <laughs> on the call for hours. Um, but I want to wish you guys a great week ahead, everybody. Godspeed. And uh, keep looking out for me. Uh, on the on the trails when I'm doing hills and push-ups. I'm waiting for, <laughs> for y'all to come in with me on hills and the push-ups. <laughs>